specific uh, point, I, Father Busman may not be aware, but I serve on the Concordia University System Board of Directors. And I was interested in your comments because your encouragement was to support our Lutheran schools, but at the same time you raised valid issues regarding our Lutheran schools. They're fairly public by now. Uh, so how is it that uh, the, the panel perceives that CUS goes forward? I'd say in general that they adopted this principle, our Concordias in general, have decided to be all things to all people. We got schools for this, you know, pharmacy school and business school and this school. And so instead of saying, look, we want to be a place where we train our Lutheran young people and you wouldn't even have to necessarily limit yourself to just teachers and pastors. You could be more of an arts and science, you know, basic, you know, preparing them for vocations. You know, read the classics. Even, you know, my sons went to Valparaiso, a very liberal school. On the other hand, they went to Christ College and they read a huge amount of material that prepared them. I don't think our Concordias are necessarily doing that. Some, you know, if you get into philosophy or stuff, I know you can do that. But I think it needs to be a more overall approach, would be my comment. I think part of what we need to do too is, you know, the, the nail in the coffin for the senior college and the system was when, what, the board of directors of Synod and Synod and Convention approved the ability for a university in St. Paul, Minnesota, to be a four-year institution instead of a college. And then you followed that with a four-year institution in Bronxville. And then why go, why go through the two-year system, two-year system, two-year system when you can get a four-year degree? So what happened, it seems, is that we adopted, as you'd say, you know, we adopted to look like the rest of the world by having universities instead of just keeping our own identity and how we did things. That we're different and we're gonna do it different and if you don't recognize it, we don't care. But we cared and we wanted to fit in. And until we, I don't know, find the gumption or the courage to say we don't care if you accept us or not, we're gonna do what we're gonna do, we're gonna to continue to endure the problems that we have. And, uh, building on that, I, I think we owe a debt of gratitude to Dr. Gregory Schultz for having the courage to blow the whistle to say what needed to be said. It needed to be said for a long time. We're hearing uh, people talking about things that happened now decades ago, Christians being mocked in, in their own university in their own school, their own classrooms, classrooms that belong to us, members of Synod, mocked for believing in the biblical account of creation. That shouldn't have even happened once, let alone all over the place. So thank you to Dr. Schultz for speaking up about it and being willing to take it on the chin. And if we're going to have four-year institutions that do welcome people from the outside, they need to understand we have a Lutheran identity. We have a confession. You're welcome as a guest here. It's not your school, it's our school. You're welcome to come and study. You're welcome to be a guest, to be a student. You know, can you imagine a Muslim institution saying, well, my gosh, we have to serve bacon in the cafeteria because, you know, we would offend people otherwise. Why can't we be Christians? I, I think either we will, and maybe the Concordia system can be um, refurbished, whether it's uh, contracted or reconfigured, or God will shut them all down. So we either decide to follow, to be set apart, as, uh, as John uh, so uh, well presented to us, or God will take care of it. It won't be our problem anymore. Uh, we also have this opportunity with uh, Luther Classical College that's coming online. There's a lot of enthusiasm for it. It's an explicitly classical model. I think there's room for them and for the Concordias. It shouldn't be one or the other, but the Concordias are going to have to come to grips with, uh, we're, we're either going to be Christian or not, 
And that means uh, being faithful to our confession. It's probably an oversimplification, but in the end, that's what it's going to be, in my opinion. I think sometimes the answer to the mess may present itself, because I'm thinking of like what happened to Seminex, that suddenly they realized they had to leave the campus because it belonged to Concordia, and so they had to go to Chicago. So one of you was talking to me, was it yesterday, about the situation down in Austin, where they're voting to leave the Concordia system. Well, all of a sudden, that's good news because that property belongs to us. So they're going to have to move out and find their own digs, right? I mean, there's, there's a ready-made solution right on our doorstep. The money, the, the place is ours. So fine, you want to leave? Go leave and we'll take over the place. Same thing goes for Mequon or Chicago or, or uh, uh, Michigan. If we have the guts to do it, you know, just show them the door and we'll take over the property and do it all over. Maybe that's a little naive, but I think, I mean, it did work in the case of Seminex, so who knows? So, so first of all, if, just in case there's some people that don't, congregations are autonomous in the Missouri Synod. So the voters' assemblies own all the paper, the, our voters' assembly own all the paper clips in this building. It's their real property. The Synod has no control over it. So the only thing the Synod has control over at a congregational level is they can stop us from using their name. So they can say, you're not Missouri Synod, you can't call yourself that. But I mean, if we want to ordain women or, or we want to worship Baal or whatever we want. We can do anything we want. The voters can legally. But the, but the institutions of synod, the seminaries, the colleges, uh, other things, every paperclip in Austin is owned by the synod. And, and their supreme voters assembly is the synod and convention. So, so that's why you know, that, that can work that way. That I agree with you, but then, the, you know, yeah, that should be great, except it belongs to the Synod and Convention, and you're acting as though that's us. Right. Unfortunately, it doesn't belong to Godestinst Inc., which would be a much better <laughs> situation. <laughs> so it's, it's typing, right? <laughs> if only we owned Concordia. Chuck hold, baby. <laughs> uh, Larry, Larry brought up an interesting thing that, that I often wonder, and it, it's something that, that I think is at the root of a lot of this problem. You brought up uh, our identity as Lutherans. And I don't know that we know what that is as LCMS. Uh, your, your identity goes as far as your context goes, and that's it. Uh, it changes from you know, one place to five miles up the road to 10 miles up the road. And, and I, don't know what we, I don't know what we do about that. I don't know that the Senate is built to, uh, to, to work with any of that. But you know, it'd be great to say, yes, we're we're Lutheran and this is our identity, but, uh, but you know, especially at the Concordias, even when I was in Nebraska, that drastically changed from classroom to classroom. I also think, you know, as far as Godestines goes, our spiritual gift together is being, I don't know, one of kind of downers. We, we have a great way. <laughs> Bring me around. We, ha we, have a, we have a great way of highlighting the bad. And we don't do so well at pointing out what is really good and great. So do, so, and what our opportunities are. So I think just in terms of well, maybe Godestines and also individual pastors is... Um, on the one hand, we all know that there are parishioners in our congregations who don't understand how bad it is, and we need to say how bad it is. There are lots of parishioners that know how bad it is, and they don't know where the good is and how, you know, what the opportunities for moving forward are. And we really have to do both. And so one of my big encouragements is, um, you know, both of us, we work for Wittenberg Academy, and we see a whole host of students throughout the country. Peterson sees students here. There are a lot of places that are doing really great and wonderful things. And there is, you know, there is actually a horizon. 
there is something to look forward to besides the return of our Lord on the last day. And, and thus, there is something to work for and fight for and defend. So instead of just becoming completely and utterly black-pilled where there is no hope and there is nothing to work for, there is a lot out there. And, and there are opportunities and there are th things that we can tweak and use for our own ad uh, advancement. Um, just keep looking for those things. And if you get caught in the, the, the whirlwind of negativity, find someone who can bring you out of it. Yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to build on that because uh, I just came from the Wittenberg Academy family retreat in Iowa. We had our biggest uh, turnout ever. We had to turn people away. We had about 300 people there and we sang the liturgy um, in, in a goddess Dean's manner too. We chanted the Lord's Prayer. We, uh, uh, we even sang the Office of Sext from the Brotherhood Prayer Book in Gregorian. I mean, we did stuff that we're always told that even our college students can't do. And I'm talking about little children through high school kids. Um, and, and you're absolutely right, Jason. The, um, the young people that are coming up now, they, um, they are, think, I think they're of a different spirit um, than, than some of the, uh, the younger people that we're seeing now. They're... They're much more conservative. They, they have a longing to be authentically Lutheran. They, they loathe contemporary worship. Um, so maybe somebody needs to get a memo to David Lukey. Um, if you, if that's you your really, job, Larry. That's, that is my, well, I'm working on it, <laughs> even as we speak. But no, I was so encouraged. Um, you know, I thought I was gonna be hanging out with the, the adults. We had a little gemutlichite um, during our retreat and I was, headed out to the campfire, and some, uh, some of my students hailed me over, and I sat with these high school kids till 1.30 in the morning. I mean, they're wonderful. They really are a hope of our, you know, they are hope, they are our future. So I, I appreciate you bringing that up, because it is easy just to be very negative, because we're always in siege mode, we're in fight mode, um, but there's light at the end of the tunnel, and ultimately we're fighting for them, and ultimately they're gonna be fighting for us. Because where do you think the pastors are going to be coming from to serve us when we're elderly and to serve our children and our grandchildren? So, um, so yes, absolutely. There is definitely light at the end of the tunnel, and, uh, the, and that's why it's necessary that we increase the chokehold. Well, these guys probably all know by now that I'm, I'm an optimist. I got it from my mother, you know? So sometimes hopelessly so, Jason, that's true. But I wonder if there's a groundswell of maybe even boomers who are not tapped because I think of the groundswell, for example, of people who are just aghast to find out what's going on at the Concordias. I think Harrison did a really good thing in launching that investigation right away because People don't know, and they're hearing, my goodness, my grandchildren are getting all this garbage in our Concordias. I think there's a lot of people who just didn't know. And I think, I mean, that negative energy can be turned for positive use if it's done wisely. So I think that, you know, sort of dovetailing on what you've been saying, there's, there's a lot of opportunity to take some of that energy and to turn it into good because there are still... A great plenty of this is also true in culture you know why a lot of people like Fox News for example in in politics because there's a lot of people who are just aghast at this CRT nonsense they don't want to call guys girls and girls guys they still know that that's a bad thing and I think that 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 our CRT community or whatever you want to call them they overplayed their hand a little too soon they were working behind the scenes they were working underground and all of a sudden, it blossomed a little bit fast for what they probably would have preferred. And our culture is not quite ready for that yet in, in the negative sense. And I don't think the church is, I'm using scare quotes here, ready for the kind of garbage that they're suddenly discovering has been going on right under their noses. And I think we need to tap into that. And I think if we do, we could see some positive results. Okay, since I'm the most negative of all. Always have been. 
No, um, I'm going to say something positive, and that is Concordia is getting blasted a lot, and I don't like things going on out there, but at the same time, I have five to ten Concordia students who drive clear across town to my place on Sundays or else go to Michael Larson's place for a church on Sunday. And, and they're, they want the liturgy. They go, that group at, uh, at Larson's place, Luther Memorial, is a good-sized group of Concordia students coming down there. And you have to realize that, yes, there is you know, some good stuff going on there. There's some good theologians who are trying to teach up there. The the music guys up there, I've had one of the guys up there is just retiring, Dr. Freeze. Freeze has played in my church. He was my organist for about five years. Uh, great, he loved being in the setting. So, I mean, there's good things happening there, even though part of the problem, I think, is they have so many instructors because they have so many students, they went for the big, and so many instructors that are on the faculty are simply just total pagans, and have no desire to be Lutheran. Well, people like these ones that come to my church, they try to avoid those <laughs> teachers, you know, if they can. Are there more students coming now from Mechelen than ever before to our fathers, or? Um, that's gone up and down, and part of that depends, you know, and who the people are. Um, so it, is, it hasn't been an increase necessarily? No. But you're saying it, but it hasn't been a... I would say it's an increase at Luther Memorial, because it's closer. That's the easier one to get to. And there's, each year they seem to get a few more of the Concordia crowd coming down to them. So you see them hungry for good liturgy, good preaching, the sacrament being there every week. So it's a good thing to see. Yeah. I think the devil drives them into our arms. Thank you, gentlemen. The, uh, <laughs> the issue of uh, identity, um, there are Lutheran identity standards for our Concordias. Uh, they have been for some time. Uh, the uh, 703 resolution, which was passed at the last convention, asked again for our synod to consider the governance model of our Concordias. And there's been a um, committee working on that uh, since the last convention. As uh, an adjunct to that work, a group was convened to write Lutheran identity mission outcomes, which are very specific descriptions of what a uh, Lutheran uh, education and a Lutheran college should look like. Those were posted for public comment. They were advertised in the reporter. Uh, there was a six month public comment period. Uh, they are available on the board of directors website of Synod. And depending on how uh, the convention goes at the next convention, if 703 is to pass, uh, the, uh, there will be a reorganization in the way that our universities are governed. But as Father Peterson said, that, that relies on the convention uh, to, to vote that to, to happen. Uh, so, Godestines needs your money. Don't forget that. Uh, but we could also use um, feedback, uh, particularly in uh, suggestions for podcast topics or guests uh, and, uh, and, and article st uh, uh, topics or, or that sort of thing, too. So, if you have some suggestions in that way, or, or help, we would, uh, we would listen. We never promise we're going to do it, but uh, I mean, you're, if you're willing to come to a conference like this, you know, then you're, you're part of us. And uh, so if you got anything to say along those lines, that could be helpful for us. Uh, I've really appreciated the podcast episodes that will take a particular feast or a particular season and, and go through not just the overview, but then some of the specific ceremonies or whatnot. And I think what would be nice going forward is maybe a little more systematic approach to that uh, to kind of fill in some of the gaps that, that you haven't hit yet. One especially that I think of, and I know I sent an email to some, I think, I think it was to Peterson, uh, saying you know, something on the Trinity season might actually be kind of nice, even though that's the one that you know, we're all just like, okay, whatever, it's, it's Trinity. Because... It seems like every book that I've read divides it differently. 
You know, is it is it a two part, three part, four part, and then you get you know LSB that does all kinds of weird stuff. But but what we, might be kind of nice is to start off with all the major seasons, and then get into some of the like minor internal seasons, and then feasts and festivals, and then so it. Because I also understand that you know well we do it every year, so you know do the podcast once you don't have to do it again. That's true, but then the next year do something else that's a little bit deeper or the next step or something like that. And then the other podcast topic idea, I know I really appreciated the, the two or three episodes on uh, Paul Lang and doing that kind of, here's an individual, here's an episode on his history, here's an episode on his bibliography and talking about the different books because then you can go out and start hunting them down. So I appreciate those types of topics. They're really, really, really helpful. And then of course in between, you know, the the mythologies, the, that, that stuff's really, really good, too. I'm not saying stop that. But a little bit more system, systematic approach to the, here's some good helps for you guys that are getting out there. Uh, and it'd be good for the guys that have been out there and just don't know what they're talking about. Yeah, thank you. I, I want to uh, say of Jason, Jason is proactive in trying to recruit people for the podcasts for exactly that purpose. And he's contacted me several times saying, hey, can we do a, you know, this is coming up, can we do a podcast? Uh, my, my schedule's been a, a smidge difficult, uh, but I'm glad you like the Lang segments. Um, and uh, uh, the, uh, the other place that we could look is the uh, column in the Godestine's uh, publication on the rubrics. Uh, I have an interest in ceremony right in a rubric. Uh, but uh, the podcasts are wonderful. Uh, Jason does a super job, and he is proactive. Uh, I think uh, on, the, on that uh, note, it's my feeling. I realize that the overwhelming majority, maybe everybody within Godesties, uh probably does the one year, or a lot. Uh, and so maybe what I'm about to ask is just beyond the pale. But do you think that for the Thinking Out Loud series, you might find somebody who would do three-year lectionary? That's beyond the pale. <laughs> it, it really, it, I think it really kind of is beyond the pale. I don't mean that because we're damning the three-year lectionary, but I mean, Goddess Feast is just really committed to the historic lectionary at, from its inception. We can right? call Rick Stuckwish. Yeah, we could, yeah. yeah. But, 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 but Rick, Rick would be the... I, I didn't want to speak out of it because I didn't know if he still yeah. did. I remember him writing a defense of it a while back. Yeah. Or if he was still, or if you had broken fellowship. But, no, <laughs> but uh, if he would be willing to do that, I really think it would be a great resource to have somebody. And, and then on a related note, sure. sometimes for thinking out loud, like when feast days occur, uh, you know, like for example, we just had, I, did, I didn't celebrate it. Uh, uh, Easter. You made reference to it. When a when a naturally occurring feast day falls on a Sunday, it would be great to have the second class feast never trumps a Sunday and Easter time. Amen. Sundays and Easter time are protected. <laughs> they involve everything, so the rubric is that a second colic is prayed, right? But the bishop of the local parish can certainly make an exception, and that's a sanctified and holy thing. Our <laughs> <laughs> great and for Senate president. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like he's going to say something who's smoothed right out. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll, add, I'll add one thing maybe to to our website. This came up for the nothing to do with really podcast or anything, but this came up during the first singing lesson. You know, maybe we could add a tab on our website that you click the tab and there's a, a sound bite or a video that takes us to, this is the way this proper preface is to be sung. This is the way the Lord's Prayer sounds. This is where it's just, where it's there. And I know there's some of this stuff on the, on the Synod website too. Uh, it's a little hard to find though. Um, but if, if we just had a tab that said, you know, here's how these aspects of the liturgy sound, where somebody, you know, if somebody needs the proper preface for Advent and can barely get through the common, you know, maybe we could, maybe we could do that to help we, guys we too. A, uh, Mike? Yeah, I was just going to say, keep doing the thinking out loud ones on the one year. It's very, it is very helpful for preaching thoughts on a week-to-week -week basis. It's really helpful. Uh, and then also the, the, 
the cultural things that you've been covering, um, you know, whether it's the gods of our age or the culture wars, feminism, whatever, you know, those various things, uh, keep doing those kinds of things too. Because I think we, one of the things that I think we struggle that we have a problem <coughs> with in the LCMS too is kind of we fall in, we fell into the trap of this false view of church and state, this separation, and you just can't separate these things out and compartmentalize them. Uh, because religion and politics, there's always an overlap. There's always an overlap. And so continue to bring those things out. It's good. You know, because technology is evil and everything we focused on is, is technology. Uh, <laughs> I, I think it would also be kind of nice, I, I, I'm thinking especially of the series on the rubrics, but then also the music and the mysteries you know, column. Um, at some point, Editing those into a physical book would be kind of nice. I mean, the rubrics, obviously, because that's like super handy. Right. But, it's, but it, using other mysteries would be really nice to put a bunch of those together. I'd actually like to do that in retirement. That's one of the one of my projects on my list. Plus, I have a series on Josh where it starts with his uh, starts in Deuteronomy and right so back in Exodus already. Every reference to Joshua and all the way through the, and I just haven't had time to. Completely finish that. So yes, there's some of that already in my dreams. What I do, if I stay alive. <laughs> on Monday and Tuesday, I was with our friend uh, Father Charles McLean out in Baltimore. I uh, preached for his theological conference, and uh, Father McLean uh, has a title, "Conduct of the Service Says," that's bound together by uh, uh, a manual press. Uh, with uh, Father Arthur Garpikorn's conduct of the service. Um, I would never uh, uh, propose to uh, push that aside, but there, we've had several requests to put the Taking Pains columns into a book. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah, um, I want to shift gears just a, a second, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, coming from this Iowa conference for Wittenberg Academy, where these, these young students are hungry for good Lutheranism, theology and liturgy. I think one of the things, at least in my 20 odd years, uh, of searching out great liturgy and, and trying to just bask in its, it, it is glory essentially. The error that comes from that and the temptation that comes from that is to look toward the East. And we've had friends who have done this. I've had fellow students. <laughs> What I heard from a couple of students is there's temptation among these students. Oh, I agree. And so what I would like to encourage you all to do is somehow come out with a statement about why that's wrong. Why, uh, you know, the, the East beautiful liturgy isn't the Mecca. Yeah. Just a mix of religions. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, that came up and I thought maybe it's time to do something again. So why not to go East? Yeah. That should do that. Okay. Uh, that that sort of reminded me of uh, the speaking of beautiful liturgy and so forth. You can go to Chicago, as I understand it, and you can go into these beautiful Episcopalian uh, cathedrals and churches and so on. I don't know if they have a cathedral, but they have these large churches. You go in there and worship with them, you'll find. There's not a lot of people, but, it, well, there might be if you put them all together in a single room, but there's such, so much space. You see couples sitting together up in front, and they're all couples of men. They have megabucks. They like the beauty, and that's as deep as it goes for them. Now, I would grant that the Orthodox, it goes a little deeper, but they have, they have gotten rid of the atonement, for starters. And so when you take away this, the meat, you start taking away the meat and you, you try to be you know, vegetarian liturgically, you miss something. And you miss something more. The, the deeper you go into to desiring beauty for beauty's sake. So I think that might be kind of what you're saying is well worth the observation. And as someone who has experienced some pain this last year because COVID led four Concordia students who were coming to my church all the time to venture out to the Latin Mass all the time. And all four of them went to Rome. 
They just fell in love with the beauty, basically, you know. Oh, it's Latin, it's pure, you know, and all this stuff. And But they were left alone, basically, at Concordia. It kind of became a nice little conventicle. And they encouraged each other to think they were smarter than everybody else. And uh, there they went, off to the, you know, you know, it just, this is what happens not all the time, really. And it's sad because, like he said, where's the atonement? Instead, they all became convinced, the one guy in particular, he got busy reading Thomas Aquinas in Latin, so he was smarter than me, even though he'd been my student all these years, you know. He just knew everything. And Thomas was right, you know, that we need to have faith plus love you know, and all this stuff. So it's it's always disappointing. I've lost friends to the East too. You know, we know what this is like, but yes, it would be a good idea for us to actually make a statement on these things. So when you're when you're buying a car, most of us can't afford new cars. Uh, and oh. you don't want to go when the salesmen are there. You drive by at night and you stop and you walk around in the used car lot and the lighting isn't very good big bright lights on top and all the cars look pretty good and then you get a little closer to them and you notice there may be some Bondo maybe some rust the East is like that it's like a used car the further away you are and the darker it is the better they look but when you put the light on then that light being the fourth article of the Augsburg Confession all of a sudden you see the uh, Bondo and the uh, bad paint job and the motor that doesn't run right uh, so uh, this is, this is also true of Rome. I wonder, uh, I'm just thinking about that whole thing. We, we tend to do mostly exegetical stuff. And uh, maybe we need to, yeah, I mean, uh, my, I mean, I'm not a scholar, but my academic stuff, work has been actually systematics. I wonder if we, if, I wonder how interesting or useful it would be if we, if we took on, like, I, we, 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 maybe we should have a podcast or, you know, on justification. Um, I think actually one of the problems is we've replaced justification with law and gospel. That, and, and that's actually a confusion, you know, that creates... Uh, so I don't know what the... You know, I don't know how useful that would feel or how interesting to the readers or the listeners, but I, I think some of this would actually address it in, in a positive way, too. Because... Really, if you, even if you think back, you know, Seminex has been noted a couple of times. Historically, it's always the exegetes that have got us in trouble. I mean, it's the it's the do, it's actually the systematicians that pull us out, right? Um, and you know, you, you said something earlier. It's really it's our kind of scholastic tradition of systematic theology that probably is our most distinctive thing. But we but we we have more fun playing around with biblical interpretation. But maybe what we need as editors, and maybe what the Synod needs in some ways, is maybe a return to the love of Francis Pieper and Chemnitz. And, so. and the historians are just eating popcorn like the Gen Xers. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, do, you do bring up a good point. I'll, I'll tie in kind of to the, to the beginning, back to, back to Monday. I wonder how many things we take for granted we think everybody yeah. knows because we're Lutheran and of course everybody knows about justification. <laughs> everybody knows about law and gospel. Everybody knows about this and uh, you know it, there are some of these things that you know, maybe our, catech our catechesis early on was lacking and we missed all of these things and we went through several years where we didn't maybe go to Bible class or weren't in attendance to the divine service and we missed this. We need to be reminded of this and we're talking you know, maybe up here about the two natures in Christ when we might not even know, or some might not even know about the Incarnation, why that's actually important. And, you know, so maybe that would be beneficial to to do kind of a, you know, a 101 thing where this is this is Article 4 of the Augsburg Confession, this is what justification is, or some other things along those lines. I'm reminded of the the recent history of the Fort Wayne Seminary. I think a number of people have written on it. 
and it's kind of fascinating how to to be very short about this concise I mean Robert Preuss discovered the Lutheran confessions mm -hmm. and then the people that he trained and learned from they learned from him about <coughs> justification in the confessions and then they took it to the next level which was liturgical decorum and so forth but that's putting the cart and the horse in the right order. You start with good theology, and from there you blossom into the other things that go with it. I think that's the way the Fort Wayne Seminary kind of evolved, and I think that was a good salutary thing. Well, that's a natural sector. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. So in, in Milwaukee, um, we were cautioned for so many years to not look to the southwest, but it was okay to look to the southeast to Fort Wayne. <laughs> and and I'm heartened to see these things happening here among our fellow Lutherans um, who are who can quote AC as often as they want to and, and also know what's in there and also to know the Holy Scriptures which have made you wise to salvation that's the whole purpose of the divine service and the liturgy is to, is to encapsulate those things and present them to us in a way that is reverent as you mentioned Pastor Larry right reverence um, for, for the Lord Jesus Christ and in that vein, um, I want to invite you to continue to, to, to do this and to reach out to people in the Wisconsin Synod because, as you know, uh, as we've learned in the last two years, uh, a couple letters after the name of your church doesn't necessarily mean something. And you, you've known that, you've learned that. It's, it's painful. We'll make sure we still have NIV and Q to make you feel right. <laughs> <laughs> well, only if it's 2011. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to be offended by it. Well, and to think about that, think of what's lost. The imagery of, of the Holy Word is, is the Son, the inheritance, right? That's, that's lost now in these scriptural translations. Um, and we, have to, we have to hold on to that. We have to hold that out also to not just to the Lutherans and the LCMS, but to the Lutherans and the Wells and the CLC and the ELS. And, and I think that it's, it's, there's nothing wrong with us getting together and discussing these things as, as academics who, who are willing to let God's word illuminate our conversation. And so that, to that end, I would say, God is Dienst has been amazing. Thank you for hosting uh, me. And uh, you're welcome to come to return to Wittenberg in October in Oregon, Wisconsin, um, and, and share in what we're doing, because I think that in the future, um, we will all need to be together. And certainly one day I know that um, through the Lord Jesus Christ and the work of his Holy Spirit, we will be together in heaven with our Holy Father too. And so I, I thank you very much for, for doing this important work.